Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. Today's guest has interests in space flight and astronomy and has recently written a hypothesis entitled the Aldebaran or the Aldebaran Project. His hypothesis can be summarized as follows. My hypothesis is that a space probe, which I will call the Ancient Envoy, was sent to Earth by advanced beings that once inhabited a place circling the star Aldebaran. Their motive was to contact another intelligent species before Aldebaran swelled up, became a red giant and destroyed their world. Possessing a high degree of artificial intelligence, the ancient envoy waited in Earth orbit, observing our planet. Eventually, the probe detected the efforts of a physically inept species, that's us, using its wits to gain an advantage over nature. Then, 6,000 years ago, when the first civilizations began to emerge in Mesopotamia, the ancient envoy released a small capsule, which I call the messenger, to make direct contact with humans. The messenger included an archive of information describing the species that sent the ancient envoy to Earth and the reasons why. Part of this archive was a goodwill gift of wisdom in the form of sciences, technologies, arts, logistics and methods of good governance that would benefit humanity. This made sense to me because, though primitive in comparison to the ancient envoy, the pioneer and voyager probes we have sent beyond our solar system into the stars contain archives of a similar nature. So, uh, welcome to the show, Derek Willis. Thanks very much, it's great to be here. Now then, um, it's a very interesting hi hypothesis, Derek, and just to point out first off, it is a hypothesis and you've, you've, you've not got photographs of this ancient uh, uh, satellite. So just explain what you mean by hypothesis first. Well, I mean, basically a hypothesis is a series of pieces of evidence that point towards something. Uh, it's not proof positive. Uh, the whole idea of the project is to seek evidence mm -hmm. and therefore to prove the hypothesis. Right. And that evidence comes from several different strands. Yeah. Uh, but just tell us, before we get into some of the evidence, uh, what's your background, and because you, you, you've done some very interesting things with uh, your own space rockets, or rockets, uh, just tell us about your background. Well, being of a certain age, I was uh, uh, born into the, the space age, and I remember the, the Apollo projects and the Skylab projects and so forth. And uh, consequently, I've always had a lifelong interest in uh, space flight and particularly in rocketry. Mm -hmm. uh, I also was very interested in the idea of uh, in an independent space program. So, civilian. Civilian mm, space program, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, probably it's getting on about 20 years ago now, I started designing and building and launching my own uh, rockets. Because you did, you did start a science degree and you're now doing a, an, astronomy degree, a, an astronomy degree, just tell us yes, about that. Yes, uh, I studied physics and electronics at uh, Lancaster University but I dropped out towards the end of second year. But about five or six years ago I began a, a part-time degree at the, the University of Central Lancashire in mm -hmm. uh, astronomy. So I I've, I've currently have like two certificates in astronomy and over the next right. two or three years. So you actually developed uh, your own fuel for th this, these rockets that you were yeah. uh, tinkering with. Just tell us about that. Yeah, there's basically three kinds of propellant inside a rocket. You can either have liquid propellant or solid propellant or a hybrid, which is a mixture of the two. And in the late 90s, I, I came up with this propellant which I called ASPROP, which is aerated solid propellant. And there's basically, there's a, a matrix of the propellant, which is a solidified uh, hydrocarbon, but inside that there's millions and millions of bubbles of compressed oxygen which act as the, the oxidizer. Right. And d did you get that patented? I put a provisional patent on it uh, back in 1997, mm -hmm. uh, but because of various things that occurred, I've mm -hmm. not really taken them much further. And, and this method of propellant, it w was it enlightened to an aero bar, or that was uh, what yeah, gave you the yeah, idea? Yes, Just tell yes. us about that. Well, I was l literally eating the bar of aero in, in uh, my garage at the time, right. and saw the bubble structure, right. and kind of thought, well, if instead of bubbles of air, there was bubbles of compressed oxygen, 
right. then it would it would work as a as a propellant. Right. So now at some point you actually got sponsorship from Nestle. Yeah. Because of this, in that it was like the idea that you got it from a bar of chocolate. Is that yeah. why they sponsored you? Yeah. But so the first rocket that you built, were you being sponsored at that for the first one or not? Uh, well, the very first one I wasn't. Right. Uh, so well, tell us what happened there, because you launched it on the moors in Northumberland, is yeah, that right? right just uh, tell us about that. Uh, it went about a thousand feet. I mean, it was it was a fairly small rocket. It was about a meter or so tall. Right. It's just very primitive uh, prototype, but so that led to some to some publicity. And and so when you so when you launched it, did you recover it when it came oh down? Oh yeah, yeah. It was on a parachute. Yeah. It was on a parachute. Yeah. And yeah. did the parachute work? Yeah, everything, everything worked. And Spot. so, who who else was there observing this first launch of this rocket? Then was it? Uh, there was about three of my friends at the time, right? Uh, who were sort of into amateur rocketry, right? As well. Right. Okay. So, do you not need uh, permission to do that kind of thing? Well, you do. It depends on how how you define the the laws. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can fire anything. Things have changed now, I should point out. I mean, back then, you know, this was getting on 15, well, more, yeah. 18 years 97. Ago. Yeah, yeah, 1997. Uh, there were actually strict laws, but amateur rocketeers like myself would just kind of ignored them. Right, otherwise. right. All right. Uh, so then y the publicity then brought a little bit of sponsorship from Nestle. Yeah. So tell us what happened then. Well, I basically got a phone call from their uh, PR company who said, look, we've seen in the newspapers and uh, on, lo on local TV what you're doing and there's ov obviously a link with Aero and Nestle, uh, would you like some money? Right. <laughs> and so <laughs> I didn't say no. And so you set up or were involved in setting up the Space Quest Foundation, yeah, which yeah. was like an amateur rocket society which had a workshop. So yes. Right. Yeah. So, and then you, so you built a bigger rocket then, is that? Yes, well, well, we then built Aerospace One, which which we flew. Uh, that there is film of it, which Nestle insisted that it was it was done almost privately, right? Because I, 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 they didn't, as far as I can gather, they didn't really want to be involved in some kind of explosion or something like that. So <laughs> they wanted to know that it worked right. first. I see. So so yeah. we we're covering their asses. It basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we flew that. And it worked fine, right? And then uh, we built Aerospace Two, mm -hmm. which is it's a third rocket. Yeah, yeah, that your, was your third, third rocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. And, uh, and how high did that one go? Well, we didn't actually properly launch Aerospace Two because we then, by that point, we were starting to get into a, a, a bit of bother with, uh, with, right. the, with the history of Nestle. Right. So, so there was certain people who found found out that Nestle was sponsoring your project weren't happy because of Nestle have animal rights people and other other people protest against this corporation yeah so so that put pay to your funding is that uh, basically yes yes I mean we started to receive uh, letters and emails I mean there weren't right. so common emails at the time yeah. from various animal rights organizations uh, basically saying do you know the, the nature of the company that you're involved in yeah you see, my mind, when I hear something like that, goes to the fact that that could be a setup. It might not have been animal rights people complaining. It Possibly. could have been, it could have been representatives of NASA, for all you know, that well, do do not want a civilian space program. You, you know what I mean? I'm not saying it yeah. was, um, but I can't imagine people who I know who are who are uh, pro animal rights wanting to stop you developing s a civilian space program. I mean, maybe they did, I don't know, but um, so one of these rockets, you got up to five kilometers in height, is yeah, that right? Yeah. All right, and, and so w was your eventual intention to launch one and get one in orbit? Uh, th that was the ultimate aim, yeah. So what yeah. you were doing is just developing a sequence of rockets to get further and further yeah. and, and, and learn from each one and then perhaps build one that you could then put in orbit. Yeah. And would that require some kind of control system on it and, f and navigation? Or oh whatever? yes, yes, it would have to have a guidance system. Guidance system. Yeah. So had you thought about guidance systems? Yeah, yes, we uh, designed, a, a, well they call it an inertial guidance system. It basically uses gyroscopes right. to give the frame a reference. Right, and would that have any like direct control electronically to the ground, or would it be an automatic guidance system? Uh, it would have been automatic, yeah, right? Pre-programmed. All right, yeah. and 
so then you, you, once this kind of uh, you'd, you'd lost the funding uh, you were approached to write a book just tell us about that day, yeah you? well I was actually approached just before we lost the funding right uh, from John Wiley and Sons mm -hmm. actually they're just called Wiley's now who are academic publishers and they had asked me to write a book on the uh, early history of, of rocketry and space flight all right, and Derek, we'll just hold it there because we're going to go for a short break. We're going to be hearing from more, more from Derek Willis after this. Welcome back. I'm talking to researcher Derek Willis, who in the late 1990s built his own rockets with the intention of trying to get them in orbit. Now, uh, round about sort of 2000-ish, you were asked to write this book about the history of space flight. Just, just tell us about that. Well, the, the basic concept of the book was that what we were were amateurs trying to build uh, rockets and the origins of, of the whole space industry was with a group of amateurs mm -hmm. at, at the beginning of the, the 20th century. Right. And so you then set about doing your own research for the history of space flight yeah. and you come across one character called Dr. Willie Lay. So yeah. just give us some background on him. Well, Willie Lay was really the... The, the guy who started it all off in, in terms of getting a popular interest in rockets and space flight. He was uh, born in Germany in 1909. Uh, he studied various sciences at that university. He wasn't actually an engineer, but he was fascinated with the, the concept of space flight. So he set up uh, an organization called the, the Society for Space Flight in, uh, in Germany, in Berlin, in 1927. And one of the very first members was Werner von Braun. Right. And so together, uh, well, there was actually about 500 members uh, at, at one point, and they started developing uh, liquid propellant rockets. Right. So von Braun, who was the lead sort of engineer of the Nazi um, uh, rocket program, the V2, who yeah. then uh, defected to the Americans and worked on, well, Apollo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, now, Dr. Willie Lay made s various comments and was also linked to the Vril Society, but you're not sure whether he was actually a member of the Vril Society. So just tell us about the Vril Society and what Willie Lay is alleged to have said. Right. Well, very briefly, he, he in 1933, when the Nazis came to power, he uh, moved to America, whereas von Braun was happy just to take the Nazis' money for developing the V2 and so on. Right. So, yeah. uh, but Will Willie Lay, he became more of a, a, of a reporter uh, and a popularizer of space flight. Because the armed forces, A, have repeatedly declared that they are not of their making, the flying saucers, and B, it would be highly unlikely that one branch of the government spends money, time, effort, and machinery on investigating something done by another branch of the government. Right. Uh, so he wrote uh, an article called Pseudoscience in, in Naziland in, mm -hmm. in 1947, which is a, it's a, f a fascinating o uh, article in itself because it, it covers some of the really bizarre sciences that the, the Nazis came up with uh, because they didn't want to believe that the likes of relativity or quantum mechanics was real because that was Jewish science. Right, so Einstein. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they they came up with a whole range of bizarre sciences, like the the, the notion that the whole universe is made of ice, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the other subjects that Willie Lay covered in the article was about an organisation called the Society for Truth, which in more recent times is called uh, the the Vril Society, mm -hmm. and th they believed that there was a mysterious energy that, that they could tap into from somewhere? Well, the, the, the first mention of Vril goes back to a book by uh, a British author called Edward Bulwer-Lytton. This was written in the 1870s and mm -hmm. it was called Vril, the Power of the Common Race, in which he first described this unusual uh, energy, which it's actually uh, Michael Faraday was probably the first person to, uh, to talk about this single energy that links everything uh, right. together. So m would that be the energy of the vacuum, the zero point energy do you think? Or is it more s sort of along the lines of the organ accumulator uh, with Wilhelm Reich? What, what, or do you think they're one and the same? <laughs> uh, well I've, I've 
tended just to think that it's cold fusion. That's that's mm. right. my thoughts on it. But I don't really rule anything out. Right, I uh, see. Now, um, the Vril Society believed that, or, or spoke about Mesopotamia and mm. the, the civilizations which existed up to 6000 BC, and that they thought that the, the, there was some ancient wisdom given to the human race at that point. Just tell us about that. Yeah, well, what the Vril Society basically believed was that uh, a race of beings came from Aldebaran mm -hmm. ar around 6,000 right, years Right, so they actually ago. specify the star, yeah, which is the yeah. title of your book. Yeah, okay, right. uh, yeah. Uh, and the, the race, they said, the name given is the, the Vrilia, which has various translations, none of which actually, the ones you look in the books don't really make make sense. Right. But anyway, that, that's what they believed, is that this race of beings had arrived on Earth around 6,000 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and, and were actually the ancestors of the Aryans. But one of the problems with the Vril Society is that anything you read about them up until about 1960 is plausible, but beyond that, it, it's just right. people adding to it. And, and, and one, of, one of the myths that they spoke about was about an egg coming from the sky. Just tell us about that. Yeah. They said that the Vrilia arrived in an, an egg, which they were never really specific what, what they meant by that. Whether, you know, it was a, a, a huge uh, craft, spacecraft right. or something like that. Right. Uh, but my interpretation is, is that the, the, the Vrilia themselves didn't actually arrive here. They, mm. They'd sent a probe here. Right. So, so what makes you draw that distinction then? That, that well, because the, there's, there's various Egyptian myths to do with the phoenix and the Benben -Ben stone, mm -hmm. which is referred to as an, as an egg. Right. Uh, and to me, it's, it's, it's not a large thing. It's, it's a relatively small uh, right. machine. Right. And you do, you, you do think that that's what they're talking about, some kind of technology? Yes, yeah. Right. Yeah. Al along with that, you think that there was knowledge imparted to, to certain people on the earth at that time or s some sort of transfer of information? Well I think originally the, the idea of this probe being sent from Aldebaran was to provide information to the whole of humanity Right. but humanity being what it is uh, those people in power got their hands on it Right. and, and kept it to themselves. And you would argue that that continues to the present day yeah, with yeah. organizations like Royal Securians, Freemasons, New World Order? Well, yes, but not, not as... Not necessarily not that some conspiracy theorists might describe yeah, as, right? Yeah. All right, th there's some sort of hidden knowledge. Knights Templar is another one, I think. Yeah. Now, w how does the Thule Society link into the Vril Society? What, just to give us a bit of background on that. Well. One of the problems with the Vril Society is, is there's not a lot of hard evidence that it, that it really existed. Right. But the Thule Society, or the Thula Society, uh, that was a real organisation that was founded just at the end of the, the, the First World War. Right. Uh, and basically cons consisted of uh, proto-Nazis, right. very wealthy people from uh, Bavaria. But what, what my uh, thoughts on it are that the, the, the Vril Society, they were inv investigating this, this idea of, of what happened with the thing from Aldebaran and all the rest of it, but they required money and resources. And let's, let's go back to Dr. Willie Lay, because you think he's g g made sort of a cloaked statement in yeah. the, that, he, that he may have actually been a secret member of yeah. that. Just tell us why you think that. Well, it's really just the way that, that the article is, uh, is written, mm -hmm. because a, a lot of people have just d dismissed it out of hand, sort of said, well, he, he just made it up. But you would then have to think, well, everything he ever wrote, he just made up. Right. But he did say that he, he, he met members of the Society for Truth, which is another name for the Vril, Vril Society. Right. And I think he's speaking sort of ironically when he actually dismisses them mm -hmm. as being a, a real organisation. So how do you think the Vril Society got their information? Well, mm -hmm. I, I think it's been handed down through a, a tradition going back 6,000 years. Right. And they speak about a disc, the Vril disc. Well, I, I don't really buy into the, that the Vril discs 
uh, are real. I think that that's uh, more of a, f of a fabrication that was right. created uh, in, from the 1960s onwards. Right. Now, there's various sections in your book about Mesopotamia mm. and the various civilizations that, that grew out of there. C can you give us a brief explanation of the importance of that region and what you think was going on there? I mean, human civilization, well, certainly in, in, the, in the Western world, originated in Mesopotamia, which basically means the land between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. And it was a very fertile uh, area, very ideal place for civilizations to begin. And one of the earliest civilizations were called the, the Ubaids. Mm -hmm. uh, they lived right down uh, near the Gulf. I believe that when there's the egg or, or whatever name you want to give it, it, w it, ar it arrived at the time when the Ubaids uh, were, were dominant in, in the area. Well, one of these earliest civilizations was the Sumerians, which we know that Zachariah Sitchin's written about. And you think that he's got his time scales wrong with interpreting some of the clay tablets and that kind of thing. Just, just tell us about that. Uh, well, I, I, I'm just going by the archaeology in the sense that the, the tablets are just dated to about four or five thousand uh, years ago. But I see no evidence whatsoever taking things back 300,000 years. As Sitchin does. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. um, now, one of the tablets, you, you actually, well, you've looked at some of these tablets yourself and tried to do your own interpretation. So just tell us about that. What, what have you uh, derived that you think the ta the, these important tablets are telling us? Well, the, 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 the tablet that I looked at, is, it's really like a, a storyboard, right. because the, firstly it's a, it's a star map. You can see there's a cluster of seven stars, which is obviously the Pleiades, and the way they are arranged is uh, the pointing towards a big bright star, which is obviously Aldebaran, because if right. you look in the sky, that, that's, that's how it works. Because the word Aldebaran actually means the follower, and it's following the, uh, the Pleiades. So it's drawn attention to Aldebaran. Right. Now then, there's also this a, a winged craft, I would call it. Yeah, which yeah is, I've seen that one. Yeah. Which is uh, next to the star, so it's drawn attention to the, to the link. Now, I think that's the object that I believe is, is up in orbit, which I call the, the uh, right. engine envoy. Right. And below that, on the ground, is a bell-shaped object, which I, which I believe is the capsule that was dropped from right. the orbit, as it were. Right. All right, and Derek, well, uh, we're going to go for another break. It's fascinating stuff. More after this. Welcome back. I'm talking to Derek Willis about his book, The Aldebaran Project, and we were just looking at some Sumerian stone tablets, uh, and you think we've got, one of them is saying where they came from, mm -hmm. the, another one is saying what's up in orbit, and another one, or another part of it, is saying what landed on the ground. Yeah. Right, and you think that they're revering all of these objects because it gave them some sort of phenomenal knowledge, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So just tell us what that knowledge was, you think, that, that came out of this capsule. Well, I, th I think it's basically the sum total of everything that the species from Aldebaran uh, had accumulated. Uh, sciences and technologies. And, and, and you mentioned in, in your book that you think, imagine all the information on the internet and it's like thousands of times more yeah, than that. Yeah. So, so what makes you think there's so much information uh, given by that, you know, in, in this craft or whatever it was? Well, I, I think it, it, it's an inference that I'm making uh, because that's what we are currently doing now with probes that we are sending out of, of the solar system. Yes. Uh, I th you know, my basic hypothesis is that the, the species uh, from Aldebaran could see what was going to happen to their star mm -hmm. and decided to send you know, the benefits of their civilization to another species. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that would include you know, technologies that we can't even imagine now. So th this sort of uh, intervention, if we call it that, from, this, from Aldebaran and with this, both the satellite and the landing capsule, you think that accounts for the expansion in human knowledge around that time that, yeah. that just some historians don't seem to be able to explain? Yeah. Right, all right. Um, now, and you then go on to talk about hermeticism. Just explain what that is and why you think it's important. 
Well, hermeticism was really uh, a sort of a, a, a synthesis of uh, religion and, and philosophy. Uh, there was this, well, he's not really a god, but Hermes Trimegetus, which means he Hermes Thrice Great, who was revered for his uh, knowledge. And he received his knowledge from uh, a series of books which allegedly came from the sky. Right. Uh, so I kind of equate that with the arrival of, of uh, the messenger. Right, the belief that if humanity can achieve divine knowledge, known as yeah. the gnosis, uh, of the workings of the universe, then by contact with the forces produced by the heavenly bodies, we can influence destiny. Mm -hmm. And you think that the elite have, have nabbed that knowledge? Basically, yes, yeah. Right. Yeah. All right, and, and you know, I think a lot of people would agree with you there. Uh, and Hermeticism was the forerunner to science. Yeah. Well, it's split two ways. You could say it's the forerunner to astrology and the occult, but in the other direction, it's the forerunner of science. Right. So just tell us a little bit about the Aldebaran star, how far away it is, and is it like the sun, and has it got any planets around it? Has, it, has Hubble discovered planets around it, for example? Just Well, it's... It's now a red giant. It's 65 light years away, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it's actually technically an, an orange giant, which right. means it's uh, it stopped fusing hydrogen just a few million years ago, right. and it's it's just beginning to fuse helium. Right. But sort of right at the outset, one of the first things I did before I embarked on the whole research was to see whether Aldebaran could could be plausible as as a star where there could have been a planet with a, with a, a, a civilization on uh -huh. And the age of a star is very important. I mm -hmm. mean, there's, there's many people talk about species coming from, say, Betelgeuze and planets yeah. like that. Is that the reticuli? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, huge stars like that aren't very old. They're probably only two or three hundred million years old. Right. So you need a relatively small star about the size of the sun. Mm -hmm. and so Aldebaran is about one and a half times the size of the sun uh, in terms of mass. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And its physical size is much bigger now. So it, it's of the order of three and a half to four billion years old. Mm -hmm. So it, there was plenty of time for uh, life to evolve on any planets right. uh, orbiting. So you're comparing um, Aldebaran with the sun and you're looking for similarities because you think that if it's life similar to ours, it would have a similar environment. And you also looked at uh, Bracewell probes. Mm. Just tell us about it, because this is another thing that humanity has done or suggested that you think another race might have yeah. be beaten us to. Yeah. So just tell us what ba Bracewell well, probes are. The idea of a Bracewell probe it was first mooted by uh, American scientist uh, Ronald Bracewell. Is that if you're going to send a probe to a distant star, mm. You, you can't, because it's so far away, you couldn't really have uh, real-time communications. Yeah. So the probe would have to be uh, autonomous. It would have to make its own decisions when it got there. And one of the suggestions he made was that it would listen out for, for transmissions from a planet and then repeat the, the transmission directly back mm -hmm. because that's something that just uh, couldn't occur naturally. Right. So that was the, ba the basic concept of the, of the Bracewell probe. Right. And so my uh, thoughts are that the, the probe that I call the Ancient Envoy is, is effectively a Bracewell probe. Right. It's sent from Aldebaran right. here. Right. And it may be that they've sent out millions of them to, to, to lots of prospective planets, I suppose. Um, I, no. I wouldn't say so because... Because there's billions of... Yeah, but... You think they've targeted the Earth? I think they have, because I think they would have observed the Earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we're only just now starting to see exoplanets around the stars. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, they would have had far, far better instrumentation and would have seen that the Sun had a, a, a planet that was right in the, in, in the Goldilocks zone, as they call it. Right. And so it was a good candidate for, for life uh, being mm -hmm. there. And some of the knowledge that that you think may have been derived, that you think has been secretized. Uh, you go into, you give quotes of, um, well, knowledge truly is power. And um, you've got a quote from Aristotle saying that the difference between the educated and the uneducated 
is the same as the difference between the living and the dead. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a yeah. Bit, it's a bit strong, that one, isn't it? <laughs> well, he was quite a character, I suppose, wasn't he? Uh, um, now, you also discuss some of the rumours of reptilian races and reptilian agenda, which you are, do you claim that the, the whole reptilian thing started in 1983 with the film V? Or, I mean, we've got dragon myths and this kind of thing. Just, just tell us about what your opinion on the, the reptilian phenomenon. Well, my, my view on, on the, the reptilian agenda is that it, it is an, it's an allegory. Uh, it's, it's not really talking about shape-shifting uh, reptiles. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think it, I think it's basically talking about what I'm talking about but right. it's kind of been uh, dressed up in a more sensational a metaphorical form. thing. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, I see. And, and that that's fear, which I speak about a lot, the, the promotion of fear in order to dumb down the masses, is linked to serpents, mm. in fear of serpents. All right. Now, who are the Watchers? Well, the Where do they fit in? The Watchers began as good guys but were then uh, their reputation was uh, denigrated uh, m my belief is that the the, the watchers were the, the people who after after the messenger arrived there was various groups of people who who had the knowledge who had the knowledge yes uh -huh. and there was first there was the people who took it away secretly and have hidden it mm -hmm. but there was a, a, a group of people who they know of the arrival of, of the the messenger and, and they protect the knowledge right. that it exists. I see. And they are referred to in some ancient texts and are referred to as er, e -R, mm. or, or I R. And and you you've also write about the Tower of Babel. Well mm -hmm. I mean what do you think that was? Well I think originally well I think it was a, a built as a a, a library which is where the, the, the messenger capsule was originally held. Right. But I think it, it, it was built, the dimensions of the Tower of Babel was conical, and I think encoded within that was, was information on, on the actual orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, all right, so what, ju just to pop this question in, uh, Derek, uh, what do you think of researchers, well, such as Sitchin and perhaps people like Michael Tsarian who would say you've got you've got um, Atlantis hundreds of thousands of years ago and then Mu maybe 800,000 years ago these alleged continents which suddenly also had advanced knowledge do you, do you buy into that or are you just looking strictly at sort of the last six or seven thousand yeah, years I'm, I'm just looking at, at the at the historical record right and finding an explanation for that historical record right right now um, you also talk about the five-pointed star, because this uh, you think could be a symbol of this secret knowledge. Just tell us about that. Well, I think it re basically refers to Aldebaran, uh, because often the the pentagram is uh, is is a red star, and mm -hmm. Aldebaran is probably the most famous of of, of the red stars. Right, and uh, the apple is often used as a symbol of knowledge from the tree of yeah. the tree from Adam and Eve and also it's fallen on Isaac Newton's head mm. and there's a, do you reckon there's a secret thing coded inside an apple just tell us about yeah. that. Yeah well that Pythagoras was famous for, uh, for introducing that notion but I think it was actually existed a lot earlier than Pythagoras but basically if you cut an apple across halfways instead of through the core mm -hmm. then the pips form a five-pointed star. Right. Uh, and also, very quickly, the tannin will turn the apple a sort of a reddish brown colour. Right. And so, it, you, to be a member of the Pythagorean society, that's how you introduced yourself. You basically you were handed an apple and a knife, and if you cut it the right way, they knew that you the, were part of the right. secret. So it's a bit like a Masonic handshake. But basically, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and interestingly, the Vril Society used exactly the same uh, right. method. Fascinating. Welcome back. I'm talking to Derek Willis, whose hypothesis um, states that there could be an ancient alien satellite in orbit uh, around the Earth. Now, you think it's in a polar orbit. Just tell us what a polar orbit is. Well, 
basically it passes over the north and south pole. Right. So it's travelling in a northerly and southerly so direction. It's, so it's going at 90 degrees to say the yeah. moon. And, and do many of the other satellites that we've put up go in polar orbits or do most of them go in horizontal orbits? What, what's, how does that compare? Well, m most satellites that are intended to observe the Earth will mm. go to a polar orbit right. because when the Earth turns, it will turn beneath the orbit yes. so that the satellite can cover the entire Earth. Now, we mentioned earlier in the interview Werner von Braun mm. and he is famous for developing the V2 rocket and you think some of that evidence is important for your hypothesis, yeah? yeah. So just explain the significance of, of rocket development in the 1930s and 40s. Well, the V2 was obviously designed uh, as a, a, a missile and uh, to, to use against uh, uh, Britain. But af after the end of the war, 1946-1947, there was uh, a spate of sightings known as the ghost rockets of Scandinavia. Yes, Timothy Good's written a lot about yeah, those. Yeah. yeah, and I've kind of spent a, a lot of time actually visited Norway to interview some people about, about really? these things. Really? Yeah. Right. And the fall into three categories is either these very small rockets which are about seven or eight feet long or there's very large rockets that are 60 or 70 feet long mm -hmm. and there's the third type is this sort of a, a winged dart thing now right. the kind of people think them there could be ufos or whatever but w what i recently discovered is that the, the wing the wing dart was actually a, a real missile being developed in secretly by sweden okay so I took that point as meaning, well, yes, the other uh, types of rockets were probably real as well. Right. And so what my, my conclusion on that is that right at the end of the war, the, the Nazis uh, with uh, Heinrich Himmler yeah. were using what, attempting to use V2s to, to shoot the ancient envoy out of orbit right. in order to acquire the, uh, the knowledge that was right. that it was not possible to cover everything in the hypothesis in a one hour long show. I will therefore give a brief summary of some of the most interesting evidence. Assuming the Nazis were indeed trying to shoot down the alleged ancient alien satellite, in order to do this, the exact orbital path would need to be known in order to know where to fire their missile. I asked Derek whether he thought anyone had determined what the orbital path might be. He explained that the satellite orbit could have been encoded in ancient monuments, such as the Great Pyramids. It's well known that the Great Pyramid is aligned perfectly along north-south. So too is a satellite in a polar orbit. Derek's original idea that the orbit is polar goes back to the mythology about the planet Nibiru. This planet, which has not yet been discovered, is known in mythology as the planet of the crossing. He deduced from this that Nibiru might form a cross with the ecliptic, where the other planets are aligned, which means it could be in a north-south polar orbit. He also contends that mythology is full of numbers, the most important being 12, and this number is related to how many lunations or moon cycles there are in a year. He concluded that if you were going to leave a satellite hidden in plain view, as it were, they would have encoded some kind of information so that people would know where it was. He deduced from that that the orbital period of the ancient envoy would probably be one-twelfth of a day, in the same way that the moon is one-twelfth of a year. Once you have the orbital period, it is then possible to calculate the satellite's altitude. As mentioned earlier, Derek believes the Nazis were trying to shoot down the ancient envoy using the V-2 rocket. He believes this quest was taken on by the Americans after Operation Paperclip. Following the Second World War, the Nazi rocket scientists moved to the US and took their knowledge with them. In 1947, there was a very mysterious rocket flight from a US aircraft carrier in the Atlantic Ocean. It was a test of a V-2 missile. The V-2 used a liquid propellant which takes hours to prepare and is therefore not normally suited to being launched from a ship. Derek described this test as highly unusual. The missile flight was in September 1947 and was right beneath the flight of the path where Derek suspects the ancient envoy is situated. 
He suspects the US were trying to knock the envoy out of the sky just as the Nazis had attempted to a few years earlier. When satellites started being launched in the 1950s, one particular satellite project in 1958 could provide further evidence that the US were trying to observe the ancient satellite. Project Pilot was the launch of a tiny satellite which weighed just around a pound into a polar orbit fitted with an infrared camera. Could this satellite have been seeking the ancient envoy? Rumors have circulated for decades about an alleged alien satellite called Black Knight. Information about this started to surface in the 1950s, including newspaper reports. Derek believes the story about Black Knight is partly true and refers to the ancient envoy in his hypothesis, but that the story has been mixed with less credible information over the years. Other evidence which Derek points to, to back up his hypothesis, is the specification of the NASA Space Shuttle. During the development phases, the US military insisted that the Space Shuttle must have the capability to return from a polar orbit carrying something weighing 15 tons, even though there was nothing publicly known about in a polar orbit weighing 15 tons. This requirement held up the shuttle program for years because both size and power requirements had to be increased. The US military were also planning to launch their own shuttles from Vandenberg Air Force Base into a polar orbit. Derek's take on this is that they were intending to fly the military shuttle to the ancient envoy, put it in the shuttle's cargo bay and fly it back to the Earth. Derek suspects the ancient envoy is highly advanced and might be capable of defending itself against attempts to take it out of orbit. He suspects the ancient envoy is still in its polar orbit above the Earth. His ambitious project is to prove the ancient alien satellite exists by attempting to film it using civilian satellites. An American company called Interorbital Systems produces and launches small satellites called CubeSats which can be owned by members of the public. These satellites can be fitted with infrared cameras and send images back to the Earth from Earth orbit. I was quite surprised when Derek told me that there is a civilian satellite program which allows anyone to have their own small satellite in orbit around the Earth. Derek believes one of these satellites could be placed in a one-twelfth day polar orbit to search for the ancient envoy. To find out more, visit Derek's website, aldebaran-project.org. And this is the basic CubeSat that's about four inches square. It has uh, solar panels, it has a camera, it has electronics. Computer. And that's the actual size of that's the thing the size that it, goes yeah. in orbit around the Earth? Yeah, that, yeah. And there's, there's been uh, a couple hundred of them launched so far. Interorbit will actually they provide the kit which you then assemble and then they, they do the launch. But you can also buy kits from other companies mm -hmm. and, and have them hitch a ride on, uh, on other, other rocket right. launches. Because one of the things about the, the ancient envoy is that mm -hmm. it's, uh, it will behave like a black body in that it will absorb light of all different wavelengths, right. but it will only emit light at uh, infrared wavelengths. Right. So the camera on board would be an infrared camera. I see. So the, the company puts them into a, an orbit that's about 300 kilometers high, but, it, but the inch envoy is much higher than that. Right. So it needs to be raised to a higher orbit. And that's what this device here yeah. is for. Just yeah. tell us what that is then, Derek. Well, that's Basically, it, it, it's a, a rocket motor which is powered by uh, water. Right. Uh, just electrolyze the water, split right. into hydrogen and oxygen using the, the electricity. Right. Uh, and, the it, and then panels. it's burned, is it? Is it, it, is it, it a jet? Yeah, yeah, it's a jet. And that will raise it to the, the orbit that you require. Right. So, so you're, you're proposing to um, get some funds together to. Uh, to buy or to launch one of these so it can then go and search for the ancient envoy. Yes, that's the idea. Yes. Right, so have you, got, have you got a fund set up for that, uh, Derek? Well, it, it, the sale of the book. That's, uh, the sale of the book? Yeah. Alright, okay, well, I better plug it then. <laughs> <laughs> so, Which, I mean, now, is it actually in print now? Because this, uh, this yes. copy that Derek gave me it was a, sort of a draft. Wasn't yes, it? well, that's what I call the manuscript edition. Right. Uh, which I've, I've probably sold a couple hundred copies of that now. But I've uh, I'm currently negotiating with a publisher to have like a proper version. Printed. Right. Okay. Well, what do you say to people who say, 
how on earth is a civilian going to find this ancient envoy when the likes of NASA and probably the Air Force and other NSA would get were bound to get it first? Is it not a? Do you see what I mean? Or might they not have already captured it? No, I don't think they have. Uh, I think after, when they attempted to do it in 1947, see, because how they tried to knock that wall, but this is what I believe, is they set off a charge mm -hmm. which would slow it down. You know, mm -hmm. if you think they're expanding the gases, are going to slow it down. Right. But it, it's not a stupid device, so it knew exactly what was going on. All right. <laughs> so I think it's kind of, uh, you know, I mean, it's like firing a pea shooter at it, really, when you right. think about it. Right, okay. Because so, you think it's quite heavy, this thing. Well, well, not so much in terms of its weight, just in terms of its defence systems, right. things like that. Right. You know, and uh, for instance, I think that the Explorer 1 satellite, it actually vaporised it, because again, it tried to get close. I mean, there's a great mystery to America's first spy satellite, right. because it never properly explained why it disappeared. Right.